I want to ask you a question, and it may seem like I've lost the point, but stick with me, okay? And knowing that we're a little slow on time, I'm gonna, I'm gonna, I'm gonna brief, I'm gonna shorten down some of the things I'm gonna say this morning because we are, we've had a lot go on this morning. Not all of it was planned, and not all of the things that were planned went the way they should. But I want to ask you a question, and I want, I want you to be considering what is it you really want this morning? What is it that you really want? If I could snap my fingers, if I could wave a magic wand, what would it be that you would want that would finally make you happy? Is there some career goal in mind? Is there some recreational goal in mind? Some of us work because we love work, and some of us work because work is a necessity to get the stuff we really want. Maybe there's a relationship you would have restored. Maybe there's a relationship you would have discovered. Maybe you're looking for some, someone you haven't found yet. Maybe you're longing to have a reunion with someone you have said goodbye to. What is it would, that would finally make you happy? That's an interesting question. And I think it's a question that I don't know that all of us really know the true answer. Have you ever known someone who looked forward to something and when they finally got it, it didn't really make them happy? I know as children, and children, children are a fantastic corrective to us as adults, right? Because when you become an adult, you become cynical and you become jaded and you lose a bit of the sense of wonder you had as a child. But the downside of that wonder you have as a child is that oftentimes your expectations are way out you know, way outside of what reality actually is, right? And so there are times where as kids, we can't wait to go do or experience something or have something. And when we finally get it, we realize it's not nearly as good as we had imagined it to be. I've only been to Disneyland once. I, that's half a time more than I needed to go in my opinion. Um, I don't, but I have, I've also seen people who for, for them, going to Disney is the thing we just asked about, right? I can only be happy if I can have this thing. Uh, the, the, have you, have you been, had any experience or heard about Disney adults who don't go with their kids to Disneyland, but they go as grown-ups to Disneyland? I think this is actually an interesting diagnostic for us. Because for a lot of people, they will spend their time, they will spend their energy, they will spend their money chasing after that thing. And for Disney, I think the, the attraction of Disney is it presents a world where we can reshape reality how we want it, right? How many Disney princesses are there? Some of them are strong. Well, d d d depending on, you get to pick the princess you want to become, right? And you get to follow that, you get to pursue that. Maybe gentlemen, princesses aren't the thing for you? Well, that's okay, because they have living cars where you can drive around being, ra you know, you can, you can enter into that world where racing is all that we live for. I think Disney is an interesting diagnostic test for us because the things we pursue demonstrate the things we really love. The way you spend your energy, the way you spend your time, the way you spend your resources will demonstrate for you, I actually love these things. What does that have to do with Palm Sunday? Well, let me take one step closer to Palm Sunday. I would like to argue that many times the things we love, the things we long for, actually become, or they are delivered to us, or we... We, we find them through relationship. Very often what we are looking for is not so much a thing, but a person. Or at the very least, until a person becomes part of that picture, we can never accomplish the end goal we have in mind. So, for example, I've already talked about relationships. In many cases, as young people, we are looking for someone who will be a partner to us, someone who completes us. You may, you may be looking for a soulmate. Lots of people, what they long for is that person to walk beside them. They're looking for a person. I know that that is the case for many. And I know for many who have had a significant relationship, they look back to a time when they had that relationship and it was intact. And maybe death or some other 
unforeseen event, or maybe it was a conflict. Something has come, and that relationship is no longer there. And so instead of the, uh, the young lady who's looking forward to that wedding day when she will become a bride, maybe now we stand at the point where the widow looks back and remembers the time when she was happy and the partnership was intact. But in both of those cases, the, the thing we're longing for actually comes to us in a person. And it's not just in relationships. There's also career goals and other aspects. When I started hunting, I didn't come to hunting until I was older. You can learn an awful lot by reading books. But when you want to learn how to hunt, there is no replacement. There is no, uh, you, cannot, you cannot find, you cannot discover, you cannot read from a book the things you will learn by actually hunting with someone who knows how to do it right. They'll tell you, don't do this or do do that. Or this equipment, you're going to spend a lot of money on it, and then it's going to sit in a cupboard for years because you're never going to use it. Don't waste your money. They're going to walk with you through the woods, and they're going to sit with you in the stand. And becoming a successful hunter very often comes through a relationship. Or think about a career or a career-oriented person. If you want to become an excellent if you want to become proficient, if you want to become a remarkable business person or a skilled tradesman or tradeswoman, if you want to learn those things that will help you excel in your career, mentoring, a mentorship, someone who knows how to navigate the paths you're going to be asked to walk, often that mentor becomes the pathway to success. I think it says a lot about us as human beings, again, we have been created as relational beings. We're, cre we're relational creatures. We were made not to be alone, but to be in fellowship, to be in communion, to be in relationship with one another. So very often, as I ask the first question, what do you want? Very often, the, the follow-up question is, through whom does that come? And maybe that person you're looking for is a version of yourself. Do you know what I mean by that? Have you ever thought to yourself, I wish I was more like that? I wish I could be more courageous. I wish I could be more appealing to, you know, I wish I was more, a more attractive person. I wish I was more skilled. I wish I was more... Maybe the person you're looking for is actually a better version of you coming down. And it is remarkable the amount of time and energy we will seek, we will spend seeking not someone else, but actually a different me. If I can finally capture, if I can finally become, if I can finally catch up with my true self, then I will be happy. What are you looking for? Who are you looking for? I would like to argue this morning, and I know you didn't come to church to argue, <laughs> Well, maybe you came to church to argue. You're welcome, but I didn't. we can talk about your motives for coming to church later on. But I would like to argue from Scripture, no matter what you are looking for, no matter who you think it will come through, the truth of the matter is there is only one person. There is only one who is coming who will finally make you. Can you turn with me to Deuteronomy chapter 17? I would like to suggest that on Palm Sunday, the question is not so much, who are you looking for? But will you receive him when he comes? Does that make sense to you? If it doesn't, I'm going to make it make sense to you. The question is not so much, who am I looking for? The question is, will I receive him when he comes? Deuteronomy chapter 17. And I'm actually going to, uh, in a second, I'll put up a bunch of other scriptures, but this one I want to spend time looking at. Deuteronomy 17. You'll notice that this chapter actually ends. Troy, can I get you to throw up the slide? This, oh, never mind. There he goes. Deuteronomy chapter 17 ends with a prescription for the king. This is who the king is, or this is who the king ought to be. This is what he ought to do. This is what he ought not to do. In Deuteronomy 
Moses is giving a series of talks about all that has come before. Deuteronomy actually literally means a second giving of the law, or the law once more, or the second time we go through this stuff. And Moses says, there's going to be a time where you want to have a king over you. Here is what God says about your king. So Deuteronomy chapter 17, beginning in verse 14, reading verse 20. When you enter the land your God has given you, and you have taken possession of it, and settle in it, and you say, let us set a king over us to be like all the nations around us, be sure to appoint over you the king the Lord your God chooses. He must be from among your own brothers. Do not place a foreigner over you, one who is not a brother Israelite. The king, moreover, must not acquire great numbers of horses, for he himself, for himself, sorry, or make the people return to Egypt to get more of them. For the Lord has told you, you are not to go back that way again. He must not take many wives, or his heart will be led astray. He must not accumulate large amounts of silver and gold. Let me just pause there for a second. For us, some of those commands may seem strange. But for the people of Israel, if they understood what a king was and how kings function, especially in the broader context of the ancient Near East, they would have understood what God was warning them against. Notice, first off, that the king is not to be a foreigner. He's, not, he's to be a native-born Israelite. These are God's chosen people. These are the people God himself has made promises to their ancestors, to Abraham, to Isaac, to Jacob. These are the people who God has redeemed from their slavery in Egypt. He's rescued them, he's saved them, and he set them on this trajectory to a land he will give to them. We're going to hear just a little bit later on. God does not hate foreigners, but he has chosen the people of Israel for a special purpose. So the first thing the king must be is native-born. The man that the Lord chooses, it says. So not only has he chosen the people, but God will choose from those special people one who he has appointed as the king. Second, they must not acquire great numbers of horses. So what's a modern equivalent we could say for horses? Battle tanks, maybe, I guess, or <laughs> drones that can drop bombs from afar. It's a military thing. Right? The king having lots of horses isn't because he's a horse fanatic. He's not an equestrian. It's because horses represent military power. God wants to help them to understand their success is not based on the size of the army or the speed of the horses. Remember, the horse's strength may fail, but I trust in the Lord. That should be the king's heart. He must not make the people return to Egypt to get other horses. So the king may say, well, I don't have horses, but I do know who has horses. Pharaoh has some horses. I bet he'd be willing to bring them to help us out. Don't return that way, the Lord says. The last one there, he must not take many wives. We're going to see that play itself out in Israel's history. But remember, why do royal people marry other royal people? Because they are intending to cement relationships between nations, right? Very often, as we read modern retellings of old stories or fantasy stories, one of the things we lament is that these poor young women are being forced to marry dukes and duchesses and kings and lords from other places because that strengthens the relationship between kingdoms. And so for a king to have married all of these other women, one of the intents is, well, now I will have a relationship and I will not, it's, it's a political marriage. The king is not to seek political maneuvers. He's to trust in the Lord. And actually God shows that not only is it, this is a double-edged sword, because yes, you may gain political, you, you may gain political strength, but there is a significant risk that as you bring these foreign women in, you will also bring with them the gods that their people serve. And so you lose on both sides because not only now are you not trusting the Lord, you are now being tempted to trust others, other gods, other powers that the nations serve. It says you must not accumulate, or you will be led astray by these women that come into your kingdom. We see that with Solomon, by the way. If you want to see that working itself out, read the, the end of Solomon's life. 
Finally, it says he must not accumulate large amounts of silver and gold. Jesus told a parable, or sorry, he, he talked, after speaking with a rich young man, he tells his followers it's easier for a camel to pass through the eye of a needle than it is for the rich to enter the kingdom of God because rich people generally are fairly comfortable. And when you're comfortable, you don't feel like you need grace, you don't feel like you need a savior. And the king, who becomes rich and wealthy and powerful, may be convinced that it's because he's such a great guy and not that God is in control. But then God says something remarkable. So all that stuff we've gone through, that all makes sense to me in a lot of ways. But there's an imperative that comes next that you need to hear and you need to realize this is the heart of everything. <laughs> Deuteronomy uh, 17, starting verse 18, says, When he takes the throne of his kingdom, he is to write for himself on a scroll a copy of this law taken from that, that of the priests, who are the Levites. It is to be with him. He is to read it all the days of his life so that he may learn to revere the Lord God and follow carefully the words of the law and these decrees. And, that, and not to consider himself better than his brothers and to turn from the law to be to the right or to the left. And he and his descendants will reign a long time over his kingdom, Israel. The most important thing a king in Israel can do is know who God is and what he has said. The most important thing he can do is to know and revere the Lord his God and carefully follow all the words of his law and his decree. How well have we done as little kings of our own tiny kingdoms? Do you remember what we talked about last week? We talked about the path out of Eden. We talked about a bad end to a very good beginning. The problems for all of us began the moment we said, we will not be ruled. We will be gods for ourselves. Now, I said we were made to be relational. Like we, we talked about how human beings are intentional, are, 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 are essentially relational. We are beings that crave relationship. We're beings that thrive when healthy relationships are ongoing. There are times where we need other people to fill certain roles, to be a support to us, to be lead. I would like to suggest to you that most of us, at some point or another, probably almost all the time, are blessed when we have leaders who do well and lead well. In fact, even those who are at the highest level need to understand what we need is someone who can lead us into truth. And the danger for the king as he sits on his throne in the palace is that he looks down on the rest of the people and he thinks, ah, I'm in charge. I'm in charge. I can go to the right or I can go to the left because I'm the king. God says, no. What you need to understand is that I am the Lord. Deuteronomy 10 actually speaks to this really very clearly. If you want to be happy, I began by saying, what, what would make you happy? True happiness is demonstrated and described for us in Deut Deuteronomy chapter 10, verses 12 to 22. Deuteronomy 10, 12 to 22 say this, And now, O Israel, what does the Lord your God ask of you but to fear the Lord your God and to walk in all his ways and to love him, to serve the Lord your God with all your heart and with all your soul, and to observe the Lord's commands and his decrees that I am giving you today for your own good. Now, I want you to hear that. Does God give you laws and commands because he likes being in charge and he wants everyone to fall in line? That's not what he just said. He says that you are to love your, the Lord your God with all your heart and with all your soul and to observe the Lord's commands and decrees that I am giving you today for your own good. To the Lord your God belong the heavens, even the highest heavens, even the highest, uh, sorry, even the uh, highest heavens, excuse me and the earth, and everything in it. Yet the Lord set his affection on you, and your forefathers, and he loved them, and he chose you, their descendants, above all the nations today. Circumcise your hearts, therefore, and do not be stiff-necked any longer. For the Lord your God is God of gods, and Lord of lords, the great God, 
mighty and awesome, who shows no partiality and accepts no bribes. He defends the cause of the fatherless and of the widow. He loves the alien, giving him food and clothing. And you are to love those who are aliens, for you yourselves were aliens in Egypt. Fear the Lord your God, serve him, hold fast to him, and take your oaths in his name. He is your praise, he is your praise, he is your God, who performed for you those great and awesome wonders that you saw with your own eyes. Your forefathers who went down into Egypt were seventy in all, and now the Lord your God has made you as numerous as the stars in the sky. The path out of Eden was establishing a throne for ourselves. Every little God puts himself on the throne. And it led us to death, it led us to corruption, it led us to slavery, it led us to alienation, and it leads us away from everything our hearts desire. We take hold of what we thought we want, and what we actually do is lose everything we actually did need and love and was good for. In Deuteronomy 17, it said, when you choose a king, make sure you choose the right king. Why did the people originally want a king? Do you remember? Do you remember the first king of Israel, what they said? Can I remind you what they said and why they chose their first king? Turn with me, if you have your Bible, to uh, 1 Samuel chapter 8. 1 Samuel chapter 8. And remember, in Deuteronomy it said, when you, want, when you appoint a king or when you want to choose a king, like the nations around you, this is how you're supposed to behave. So God has already prescribed in Deuteronomy the path forward, but I want to pay attention to the motivation. What motivates these ones to want a king? When Samuel grew old, it says, he appointed his sons judges for Israel. Now, let's face the facts. Samuel's sons were terrible judges in Israel. That's part of the problem. They stink at that job. The name of his firstborn was Joel, the name of his second was Abijah, and they served at uh, Beersheba. But the sons did not walk in his ways, and they turned aside after dishonest gain and accepted bribes and perverted justice. By the way, we just read that that's never how God operates. He never perverts justice, he never accepts bribes. These are the opposite of godly men. So the elders of all Israel gathered together and came to Samuel at Ramah, and they said to him, You are old, and your sons do not walk in your ways. Now appoint a king in Israel, such as all the other nations have. Do you see a problem with that statement? What are they looking for? Well, let me ask a different question. What is it that makes Israel unique, and upon what does their success hinge? God, right? We just read it in Deuteronomy. God says, look at who I am, look at what I've done, follow me with all your heart. And that is what is distinct about Israel, because everyone else follows somebody else. So when they come and they say, we want a king like the other nations, what are they really looking for? They're looking for someone who can give them success on the same terms that everyone else sees success. What do they need from their king? Deuteronomy says to follow the Lord and to lead his people into his righteousness. I'm going to ask you an uncomfortable question now. Do you remember when I first started off and asked you what you're longing for? Do you remember at the beginning when I asked you through whom does that come? <coughs> Does the heart we see demonstrated in 1 Samuel 8, does it resonate with your heart at all? Those longings you have, those desires you have, those people you're looking for, do they look anything like the picture being promoted by this world? I am ashamed to admit how much my longings are shaped not by God and what he has for me, but by the stuff I encounter in the grind of daily life. This is what happiness looks like. 
Can I, I'll, I'll give you a really quick example. My retirement planning. I think I shouldn't be retirement planning. I don't think anyone, I, I don't see anywhere in scripture God says that you should live paycheck to paycheck. Just be frivolous and trust that God's going to pick up the slack. I don't see that perspective in scripture anywhere. In fact, when, Israel, when Egypt was facing a famine, do you remember the story of Joseph when Egypt was facing a famine? What was the instruction God gave through a dream to Pharaoh? For seven years, store up the extra grain. But for, for that time of plenty, store up the grain so when the time of famine comes, you have what you need. Don't wait for God to give you a dream about that, okay? <laughs> be wise with what he's given you so that you have margin to be generous. Like, use your wealth so that you have enough to give to the people who are genuinely needed and you didn't plan for. But also, use your wealth in such a way as when the hard time comes, you're able to thank God for his provision in the past. That makes sense, right? So I don't think retirement planning is a bad thing. However, the picture given to you by the world of this is the, the beauty and joy of retirement, it's not true. It's a lie. If you work today so that one day you may experience wealth and prosperity, and that's your end goal, you've lost sight of the fact that Jesus said to us, very clearly, store up treasures in heaven where there's no moths, there's no rust, and there are no thieves. Because you know what there are here? Moth and rust and thief. And I saw this so radically demonstrated for me. People who retired just before COVID. Did you, have, did you know anyone in your circle who retired just before COVID? And they said, in the next five years, these are the destinations we're going to visit. Did, did you know anyone like that? You, they did not visit those destinations during COVID, did they? And you know what? Coming out of COVID, and I, this is something I'm trying to learn, a very important life lesson. They were three or four years older than they were at the beginning. And some of those trips are now impossible. And I have a great deal of sympathy for individuals who experience that. But you know what happened? They had a purse with holes in it. And the moths laid their eggs in the cabinets. And the rust began to corrode. Josh was commenting the uh, one of the things under my truck is all rust, rusted in yesterday. And the thief broke in and he stole what their hope was hanging on. And if I am going to be led to see happiness and joy and the longings of my heart in terms of the world sees it in, I am going to have my heart broken. So the question is, who are you waiting for? Who can bring you real, lasting, meaningful happiness? Turn with me to John chapter 8, and we'll finish off there. John chapter 8 sees us at a different festival. Not the Passover this time, but Jesus is at the festival speaking, and in John chapter 8, if we turn to verse 21, we're going to read one of his addresses to the crowds. Once more, Jesus said to them, I am going away and you will look for me and you will die in your sin, but where I go, you cannot come. This made the Jews ask, will he kill himself? Is that why he says, where I go, you cannot come? But he continued... You are from below, I am from above. You are of this world, I am not of this world. I told you that you would die in your sins if you do not believe that I am the one I claim to be. You will indeed die in your sins. Who are you, they asked. Just what I've been claiming all along, Jesus replied. I have much to say to you in judgment. But he who sent me is reliable, and what I have heard from him I will tell to the world. They did not understand that he was telling them about his father. So Jesus said, when you have lifted up the son of man, then you will know that I am the one I claim to be. The, the Greek there says that I am. Echoing the statement of God's identity to the people of Israel. Then you will know that I am. And that I do nothing on my own but speak just what the father has taught me. The one who sent me is with me. He has not left me alone, for I always do what pleases him. Do you hear the echoes of the king in this? 
What was the king supposed to do? He was supposed to write down the words of the law, and he was to follow it every single day. What does Jesus say? He says, I do nothing on my own, but I speak just what the Father has taught me. The one who sent me is with me, and he has not left me alone, for I always do what pleases him. Even as he spoke it, many put their faith in him. Some of them are beginning to understand, here's the one we've been waiting for. To the Jews who had believed in him, Jesus said, if you hold on to my teaching, you are really my disciples. And then what? Then you will know the truth, and the truth will set you free. They answered, and we are Abraham's descendants, and have never been slaves of anyone. How can you say that we will be set free? Jesus replied, I tell you the truth. Everyone who sins is a slave to sin. Now a slave has no permanent place in the family, but a son belongs in the family forever. So if the son sets you free, you will be free. Indeed. On that day, approaching Jerusalem, the crowds began to understand the king was coming. And we know they didn't get it. We know they didn't completely get it. Even those who were closest to him, they did not understand. Peter, who had asked by Jesus, who do you say that I am? Who replied with the right answer. You're the one we've been waiting for. You're the Messiah. You're the Christ. Peter had the right answer formally. But when Peter saw the death of his friend, of his teacher, of the one he believed would become and set everything straight, when Peter saw that death, he denied Jesus three times. They didn't, it didn't quite land home yet. Don't be like them. Don't come to church because it's nice to come to church. Don't believe in Jesus because your parents said you ought to or because you kind of like the way it makes you feel. Don't shout the right words but never really understand that they're meant to change you. This Easter, we have an opportunity to receive the king who has done exactly what a king ought to have done, who is our king. Jesus is what you've been looking for, period. There are very few times I can say something in a church and I know it applies to everyone, okay? Parents, you're probably struggling with things that the grandparents don't have to deal with. Singles, you're dealing with stuff that the married couples don't have to deal with. Married couples, you're dealing with stuff that the singles don't have to deal with, right? Like, we're all such unique individuals, and praise God, he needs all of us in our individual situations. And he gives us individual gifts. And this one's a blessing to me in this way, and that one's a blessing to me in another way. Thank God we're so different. But thank him even more that this Sunday I can get up and I can say to all of you, Jesus is what you've been waiting for. Jesus is the one you've been looking for, and in him you will find everything that satisfies your soul. It is not an oversimplification. It is not an overstatement. Jesus will later say, I am the way, the truth, and the life. And no one comes to the Father except through me. We stand on the edge of Holy Week. And I know you probably don't know all the names for all the days. Does anybody know all the names for all the days? Anybody looking forward to celebrating Maundy Thursday this week? Probably not. So I don't need you to know all the trivia, but I do need you to hear this. The king is coming. Let's receive him well. Let's pray.